Hello and welcome everyone to Promethean Democracy, Speculative Governments on a Planetary Scale, led by Jason Adams. Um, I'm going to now pass the mic to him. Okay, so I just want to go over uh, one more time just the basic idea of this class. Um, it's called uh, Promethean Democracy, uh, Speculative Governance on a Planetary Scale. And the idea of the class is that we're trying to, once I think, um, I got a, a couple responses from people who uh, felt that it was too philosophical, and then I had other people who thought that it was too uh, too practical. Um, and really, what I'm trying to do is is, is both at one, at one time uh, in, in the idea of this class. So we're trying to be very kind of materially grounded, but also speculative enough to kind of imagine um, alternatives and and sort of uh, strategies and uh, trajectories that could that could uh, lead us towards. Um, uh, some some way of restraining uh, the power of the nation state, uh, which is you know of course very much wrapped up in uh, the history of uh, capitalism, uh, of eco ecocide, of uh, imperialism, um, and uh, a number of other uh, major major problems that, that the world faces today. Um, so. Um, uh, and uh, one of the main criticisms that people uh, will often bring up is that um, uh, is that when we talk about democracy, and especially when we talk about uh, direct democracy, um, <clears throat> such as we saw in the Occupy movement or anti-globalization or say May 68, or uh, almost any of the major um, social movements since the 60s, uh, direct democracy has been uh, a major demand uh, and a major method uh, of decision making, um, but very often this this idea has been uh, kind of circumscribed only to uh, local assemblies of maybe a thousand people, uh, or it's been kind of uh, or like New England town halls have been fetishized, and it kind of gives you the, the picture that if we're going to have uh, a more meaningful democracy, a more radical democracy, that it really needs to happen on just a small scale. So, um, class is to really think uh, how can we retain what is what is good about democracy, what is liberatory about it, um, and emancipatory about it, and yet at the same time, scale it up to the level of the planetary in a way that would actually be representative of, of the entirety of the world, and not just the entirety of the world as one, but the multiplicity of the world uh, in the sense of having kind of, you know, proportional representation uh, and uh, things like that um, that could occur. So. Um, the two major forms of democracy that we've seen historically have been uh, have been uh, representative democracy, as we as we've had uh, uh, after capitalism. Um, if you've read Dave, David Graeber's new book, uh, The Democracy Project, he goes into this quite a bit. He goes into the origins of um, American democracy, and he points out that uh, the whole point of represent, representative democracy was really to create a mixed system of, uh, of aristocracy uh, combined, with, um, uh, combined with, with voting, which is based on popularity. And of course, the only people who can really win an election like that are the aristocracy. So I just want to quote real quick from that uh, before we go into uh, the guest lecture, um, uh, just to kind of get our feet wet a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we're not actually reading this book. I think the, the, the the description of this book, um, The Democracy Project, is really fascinating, but when you read it, uh, it's really mostly about Occupy and uh, kind of things like that. It doesn't really do what it claims to do, in my opinion. It doesn't really um, offer that many uh, alternative frameworks um, to consider, but there is a, there are a few places where it does in chapter three. Uh, so I wanted to read briefly from that. Um, so he says, uh, when the framers of the Constitution, he's speaking of the US Constitution, spoke of an aristocracy, they were not using the term metaphorically. They were well aware that they were creating a new political form that fused together democratic and aristocratic elements. In all previous European history, elections had been, had been considered, as Aristotle originally insisted, the quintessentially ar aristocratic mode of selecting public officials. So, um, so he's already starting from the assumption that elections are inherently aristocratic and they, they are not really uh, democratic. Um, he goes on and says, uh, in elections, the populace chooses between a small number of usually professional politicians who claim to be wiser and more educated than everyone else 
and choose the one they think is the best of all. This is what aristocracy literally means, the rule of the best. Um, elections were ways that mercenary armies chose their commanders or nobles vied for the support of future retainers. The democratic approach employed widely in the ancient world, but also in Renaissance cities like Florence was lottery, uh, was a lottery system, or as it was sometimes called, sortition. Essentially, the procedure was to take the names of anyone in the community willing to hold public office, and then after screening them for basic competence, choose their names at random. This ensured all competent and interested parties had an equal chance of holding public office. It also minimized, minimalized factionalism, since there was no point making promises to win over key constituencies if one was to be chosen by lot. Elections, by contrast, fostered factionalism for obvious reasons, because then you get political parties and uh, and you get, you know, basically one party be claiming to be representative of um, uh, kind of the ruling classes, another party claiming to be representative of the middle and working classes. Uh, and then it's just a two party system. Um, and both of them are kind of lying in various ways. Um, he goes on and says, it's striking that while in the generations immediately before the French and American revolutions, there was a lively debate among Enlightenment thinkers like Montesquieu and Rousseau on the relative merits of election and lottery. Those creating the new revolutionary constitutions in the 1770s and 1780s did not consider using lotteries at all. They only used the fun, the the, uh, the only use they found for lottery was in the jury system. So we have we have this in the jury system, and this was allowed to stand largely because it was already there, a tradition inherited from English common law. And even the jury system was compulsory, not voluntary. Juries were and still are regularly inf informed that their role is not to consider the justice of the law, but only to judge the facts of evidence. There were to be no assemblies, there was to be no sortition. The founding fathers insisted that sovereignty belongs to the people, but that unless they rose up in arms in another revolution, the people could only exercise that sovereignty by choosing among their members of a class of superior men, superior both because they were trained as lawyers and because uh, they come from the upper classes, uh, meaning that they were wiser and better, able to understand the people's true interests than the people themselves. Since, quote unquote, the people <clears throat> would also be bound to obey the law, uh, the law is passed by the legislative bodies over which this new natural aristocracy presided. The founder's notion of popular sovereignty was really not too far removed from the old medieval notion of consent to orders from above. So I just quoted that at length because uh, I really did want, want to assign that book, but it, it just does not, um, that's pretty much the only place where, uh, where it directly uh, offers an alternative and, and kind of gives a, gives a historiography of this alternative of sortition uh, and of latocracy. Um, <clears throat> and I think much better is Ron Sierra's Hatred of Democracy. I think he goes much more deeply into it. Uh, CLR James, Every Cook Can Govern, which we're reading today uh, and discussing today also does that. So. Um, so those are the concepts that we're looking at is uh, sortition as an alternative, uh, isonomia, when we'll read uh, Kojin Karatani's book uh, by that title. And then um, those are really the major readings. Uh, so, so that'll be this session, uh, the next session, and then we'll move on to diagonality. And in the final session, we'll kind of uh, wrap up uh, the class. Um, but today what we're, uh, what we're, what we're talking about is uh, the Ranciere text and the CLR James text, both of which are essentially on sortition. Uh, so that's why I kind of started with that topic and started with the quotes from Graeber. Um, but we do have a special guest today. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, comes from, uh, uh, he's been working with uh, World Parliament now uh, and uh, previously uh, has, has kind of followed and uh, engaged with um, uh, uh, engaged with uh, UNPA, which is the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. Um, and uh, his name is uh, Fabian R. Elliter, and um, we're really pleased to have, have him here to, to speak. Did I pronounce your name right? Yes, yes, you pronounced it exactly the German way, El Eder, uh, and like it would have been changed to El Ender or something in the United States, but it hasn't happened to me. Thanks, God. Um, thank you for the attention. Um, yeah, my name is Fabian L. Eder, and I work for World Parliament now as a campaign manager, and we try to get more people involved into the World Parliament affairs. 
um, and these affairs are by now not yet granted to be institutional, but we're trying to get an institution. And what we do for that is um, making photos um, with panels, putting them into the internet um, in social networks. We are holding speeches. We are giving um, lectures about the issue. Um, and uh, other people have been presenting also the scriptures of the websites, the different books that have been published about this topic um, and they all can be seen on the website. Um, I'm not sure whether I have the opportunity to uh, share my screen, but I think it's not possible here. Is it right? No, it's possible. It is possible. Uh, and where's the would be the button? It's, it's a button on uh, the left. It's a green button on the left. A green one. Okay. Yeah. It says screen share. Yes. Okay. Right, and here we are. Okay, that is now multiple. What I want to show, uh, to go through with you, is uh, this little um, presentation I prepared. So I have to overlap it, and I hope you can see it well. That um, we're going to talk about the World Parliament now as an activist movement and what's behind it. Because for World Parliament now, I'm an official speaker. And uh, th th this uh, thing has uh, been founded, World Parliament now, not so long ago. It's uh, been like in 2012, if I'm not wrong about it. I was part of that founding. And here we can see the website. Um, this is the activist movement behind most of the movements that go for a democratic um, parliamentary assembly to the United Nations. And um, who we are is best to see here in the gallery. Um, we are all the world federalist movements that um, join and gather on a, a, on a common schedule. Um, and all the people that meet again and again for the cause of federalism and especially world federalism. So all these people you can see here on the photos are believing into um, the possibility to have one world state in the end by going through um, building up the democratic basic needs like the world parliament. Um, Yes, and these photo actions is the mo most important thing we have currently. This is Andreas Bummel, the founder of the UNPA campaign. And uh, you can do it alone on yourself in the backyard or in, in the little chamber or um, with your group and then explaining who this group is, what, uh, what are you uh, going for. For example, these are the Germans around about um, professor, former professor now, Dr. Rasmus Tenbergen. And he is a member of the leading union party that um, in Germany that does not want the world parliament. And he would be my favorite activist to convince our governments to, to have this thing promoted. And they don't even want to promote it. They don't believe in it. This year is in Italy. And you see this goes on and on. Um, and all these pictures um, are nice and published and also seen by um, delegations at the United Nations. Here is the founder to see um, from World Parliament now. He's in Denmark. His name is uh, Peter Olmunger. And he is a evangelic priest by profession. So this is the the office of the Citoyen du Monde in Paris. And uh, they are one of the oldest world federalist tribes here in Europe and pretty important. They uh, held and hold um, here the context to the world citizens in New York and Geneva, but they formed their own movement because they weren't uh, so much satisfied with the world citizen affairs from over the um, ocean, from over the lake. This year is uh, Kong Jack, our um, most important activist in Thailand. He founded the World Unification Club with uh, its pink t-shirts and they put pretty much money into that and um, what they're doing on the former photos it was to see is building in the middle of the jungle a world parliament monument 
that is the, called the One World Monument and shall rebuild um, the Earth's structure and its geography in a big circle. And uh, this is a spiritual thing for uh, for him, and he hopes that someday the Thailand state will sustain him to to have it much much bigger and a um, education center for uh, for world citizen affairs and for pro, pro world parliament. This year is in Africa. I don't know where actually. Um, this year is in Ventotene. Ventotene is the most important location in Europe for federalist affairs. That is where the federalist manifesto and the European manifesto have been signed in the 40s. And uh, each year the um, young European federalists have their meetings on Ventotene. Also concerning about the issues of a world parliament and not only the European federal affairs. So, clear to see more photos. I here is together with the whole UNPA campaign. Um, a, a photo. Um, now, where I wanted to go. Um, I've also taken a picture of people I just met on the street, like this group of Nepalese engineers, together with the World Parliament now panels, um, that made up a pretty, pretty good photo. And that's like the most important thing this movement is uh, nourishing from these pictures because they are vast, they're giving a emotional blanket for the soul uh, that you're not alone into wanting having a world parliament and uh, to have it illustrated being a big movement that is behind that. And the actions of World Parliament are also quite important because they, as you can see here, are pretty um, evolved already. We had only two events in the United States now in the year uh, 2017 it was. And, and we hope it's getting bigger. Um, all these things are per personal, personal encounters and presentations um, in a physical way. So, that is World Parliament now, the pure activist side. We have, we have, of course, also a manifesto of World Parliament now, but this manifesto is not as important as um, the manifesto of the UNPA campaign. That's why um, I'm going now to the deeper contents. Um, so, the UNPA campaign is not completely World Parliament now. The UNPA campaign was built as a diplomatic campaign to contact all the national um, deputies to the parliaments um, on the earth. And uh, we can see now here on the supporters list um, how many people in which states have already signed. That is here that uh, that big map on the supporters side of the UNPA campaign. And if you click here on Canada, we can see here on the right that um, 45, 55 members of a parliament have uh, subscribed in the United States. This was only two members of parliament that have subscribed. Mexico, one member of parliament. In Brazil, eight members of parliament. Argentina, 13 members of parliament. Colombia, only one member of parliament. Ecuador, three members of parliament. I cannot tell you um, why so few people have underwritten yet. Um, I guess the issue might have to do with time delay, but it also might have to do with the kind of uh, presenting oneself and the um, pressure one's making. So um, my personal doubt is that uh, we're just simply not present as a movement tied up um, and therefore there'd be so few subscribers. The same is here, like if you go to Asia, you'll see that in China we have no supporters, in Mongolia we have three supporters. In Japan, which is traditionally a forceful, big uh, world federalist movement nation, only three, here Australia six, and India has 18 members of parliament that um, officially sustain the um, UNPA campaign proposal. This proposal is uh, pretty well thought through. Um, here is. Um, here's the manifesto of it. Where was it? Declaration. 
we could go through together. This declaration does not um, talk about the technical details. That is more or less here um, the philosophical and politological um, framework for the idea and how it is um, pillowed. I, I just read it to you. The appeal for the establishment of the Parliamentary Assembly at the United Nations. Humanity faces the task of ensuring the survival and well-being of future generations as well as the presentation of natural foundations of life on Earth. We are convinced that in, uh, that in order to cope with major challenges such as social disparity, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the uh, th uh, threat of terrorism and endangerment of global ecosystems, all human beings must engage in a collaborative efforts to ensure international cooperation, secure the acceptance and to enhance the legitimacy of the United Nations and strengthen its capacity to act. People must be more effectively and directly included into the activities of the United Nations and international organizations. They must be allowed to participate better in the activities of the UN. Well, we therefore recommend a gradual implementation of democratic participation and representation on a global level. We conceive the establishment of consultative parliamentary assembly at the United Nations as an indispensable step. Without making a change of the UN Charter necessary in the first step, a crucial link between the UN, the organizations of the UN system, the governments, the national parliaments and the civil society can be achieved through such an assembly. Such an assembly would not simply be a new institution as a voice of the citizens. Such an assembly would be the manifestation and vehicle of a changed consciousness understanding of and understanding of national politics. The assembly could become a political catalyst for further development of the international system and of international law. It could also uh, be substantially uh, substantially contribute to the United Nations capacity to realize its high objectives and to shape the globalization positively. Um, a parliamentary assembly at the United Nations could initially be composed of national parliamentarians. Step by step, it should be provided with genuine rights of information, participation and control vis-a-vis -vis in the United Nations or in the organizations of the UN system. In the later stage, the assembly could be directly elected. We appeal to the United Nations and the governments of its member states to establish a parliamentary assembly of the United Nations. We call all organizations and decision makers and citizens engaged with the international common interest for supporting this appeal. Yep, that is the appeal. Um, it does not talk about how it would be um, uh, looking out concretely. The charm about the UNPA proposal is that it got a complete uh, idea behind it and a complete structure. These um, technical things of how the parliament would be composed um, how, um, how many people would elect one deputy and so can be found in the first publication from 2010 and 2011 in these documents, the case of uh, for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly and the composition that is here for the only technical thing, the composition of a Parliamentary Assembly at the United Nations. The case for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly um, um, gathers together um, the legal arguments and the philosophical arguments um, for its need. Okay, here is the campaign um, pathway, uh, how to make it the, uh, in the best way. And it, this hasn't changed uh, since then. As you see, it is still um, campaigning and working. The main tool of the UNPA campaign, so the vehicle where it goes and where it gathers contacts, is the IPU. The IPU is the oldest World Federalist uh, Association on Earth. It's called the Interparliamentarian Union. And that is the association of members of parliament that want to go and thrive for an international democracy. You can see in the slogan of the Interparliamentarian Union is for democracy for everyone. That includes mankind. Um, and it is typically that uh, most of the IPU members have signed the UNPA campaign, and uh, but not most of the members of national parliaments are members of the IPU. Um, nonetheless, it got a big, big renomee, this association, and 
uh, with its merits, uh, you can go housing like everywhere and sell your stuff. That is how this more or less works. Um, Andreas Bummel has, has his friends there. He also goes to the um, German Soci Association for the United Nations. And they have now their, their linkage and uh, are convinced of, of uh, this can become true. Could, could you say a little bit about the, uh, <clears throat> you were pointing at a PDF before that talked about uh, the actual structure of it? Um, like, 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 how would people be elected? Uh, yes. To, to, how would people be elected to the UNPA? Would it would it be through um, uh, kind of representative democracy or uh, and kind of like? I, I, I guess the thing um, that I'm wondering because we're talking about sortition today, which is a method of selecting. Uh, okay. um, and so I'm wondering, would it be? What, how what would it? Explain it again. A sortition was a kind of what method? It's a it's a it's a method of uh, selecting um, uh, representatives okay. in which in which it's basically by lottery. So it's like mm -hmm. it's very similar to like jury duty. So it's 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 uh, it's based on the assumption right. that, that everyone is equally fit to govern. Everyone is equally mm -hmm. capable of of governing. So if we really believe that, then um, because one danger that I see is that uh, if if the UNPA continues, uh, just kind of scales up uh, what we already have, which is representative democracy on a, mm -hmm. uh, on a state scale to the global scale, we could easily just end up with more, um, with basically the same demographics, the same kind of people who are who are currently in government, which is primarily, uh, you know, millionaire and above white males. Um, and uh, so, so you know, of course, it would be different in different countries, but it would still probably be kind of the uh, kind of global ruling class, uh, unless there is some other method of selection, such as sortition, in which um, in, in in which people would be able to be uh, selected by lottery, and it wouldn't be a popularity contest. It would be the logic would be not are you the most popular uh, because you can you can. Uh, because your voice is loud enough, because you have enough money to buy advertising, but yeah. rather um, that you are representative of your of your uh, country or your area, your region, precisely because you are uh, random. It's because you're random, uh, bec because you're randomly selected. I, I, I can see your point, um, but I have to tell you that we strongly believe here in Europe that we um, can choose between worse and better and sure. that therefore um, the presentation of candidates is there and maybe the presentation of parties. Okay. But um, the democratical election process has its uh, meaning and its importance uh, for this. It is not so that it would be so big, the international parliament, that and the quality of persons in that uh, wouldn't be of belong. Right. Would be very much so. Is there any discussion of um, of kind of like for one other way that sortition has been used, uh, like like in the UK? I, I know that uh, economic uh, politicians who work in uh, economic fields, who are, who are kind of like top level bureaucrats in um, uh, in economic policy departments, they they're required to have like a um, they're not required yet, but there's a movement to to basically uh, force them to be required to have a panel of citizens who are selected at random who can basically advise them on, you know, what the effect of existing policies has been uh, on, say, somebody who's like a single working mother uh, living on, you know, 15,000 a year. Um, and, and to hear that person's perspective when they're trying to decide these policies. Is there, I guess what I'm asking is, is there, um, is the idea, I totally agree that, you know, it's, it, Better mm -hmm. is better. You right. Know? <laughs> um, uh, I'm just wondering if there has been any discussion of kind of like alternative models of um, of of democratic uh, uh, election or selection, and also like des decision making. Um, are, are there any alternative models that have been looked at that are uh, maybe not in practice right now, but um, but could be used in that environment? Um, only the small ones are talking into that direction. The Pirate Party 
um, if I may talk about that, Pirate Party wants a direct democracy to the um, world stage two. Um, okay. I'm sure. So going back on that screen thing. Yes, yes. Am I back? You know, the Pirate Party is going into direct democracy, and we have a, democ a direct democracy movement in uh, Germany, which is very strong and which wants the possibility of making nearly every decision a um, basic democratic um, decision, which actually would be quite costly because a um, federal wide election costs 80 million euros, that is around about 100 million dollars. Yeah. And uh, yes, these are those votes. Um, all others are would be all right with a normal representative uh, democracy. The, the models and projects for the absolute direct democracy are not good enough and not yet good enough. And uh, I, I can't see it coming by now. Yeah. Um, that we'd be going there, but um, it, might, it might very well be. It's just a, a thing of being en vogue uh, and modern um, yeah. as a, such a bad software like Bitcoin can can make billions, then um, I think uh, digital polls worldwide could too. So that's my personal opinion to, to that. But um, like all parties that are currently governing in all over Europe couldn't imagine anything else but a representative candidate election. And they wouldn't have be, to be party bound and they could be unpartisan too, but probably they would be and partisan, because uh, with that background, you have more money for your election trip. I can tell you, like uh, making um, posters all over Munich costs around about twenty thousand um, euros. Then having two or three halls and and, and speeches um, with it, then you're about forty to fifty thousand euros for for that one campaign only in that city. Yeah. 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 And and I mean. To some extent, I, 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 one of the big questions is, you know, is it is it reasonable to think that we can, that we could scale up uh, complete direct democracy to the global level? Um, I would be of the opinion that uh, it might be an interesting experiment, but I agree with you. It would be very expensive. It would be very difficult. Uh, it would also be subject to sort of the whims of public emotion uh, stirred up by the mass media, uh, mm -hmm. and there might be issues like that. So um, <clears throat> so that's why I was thinking this idea of sortition where people are selected by lottery could could actually be more truly representative of, of the population at large, but still be like, um, still be practical in the same way that, re that we can say <clears throat> like a smaller number of people in a representative democracy is probably more practical than a complete direct democracy. But in my opinion, it would be more representative if they were not elected. It'd be more representative if they were randomly selected. This kind of blind thing. Point is whether they'd be capable then to talk at all. Like if you got a heavy retarded just hit by a car or something, and he'd be uh, balloted uh, by accident, then yeah. you've got pretty much a damage to to your power and to your system. Sure, sure. Yeah, but there yeah. there could be methods of of accounting for that though. But yeah. Mm. Um. Could you say a little bit about like 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 kind of the the relationship between the current UNPA and World Parliament now and sort of the long term like <clears throat> the long term history because uh, for sure there's been talk about this uh, right after World War II with <clears throat> with yeah, Einstein. Yes. I'm into that too. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I, I go back to the sharing of the screens. Okay. So um, there is on the website a history bar of the Junpa campaign itself. This history bar starts um, here before, now it's before uh, 1945, that's new, haven't seen it. But here you can see now, um, Andreas just promised me he would do that and he now did it, um, the most important events towards a uh, democratic mankind. And you have here name dropping Albert Tennyson, a British poet, uh, with its poem Loxley Hall. You might know it. I, I haven't known it, 
but um, in that time in Biedermeier and in <clears throat> in the 19th century, um, it is said that every every diplomat and most of the people on earth knew that poem by heart. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> it for for my for my personal understanding, it starts not early enough because. Um, Immanuel Kant has written the uh, Manifest to the Eternal Peace in the years of 1780 or something, and it was already clear after his critics of the clear um, ratio that he'd be working into the direction of a international international parliament, and uh, he was at um, the end of the German classics, uh, Immanuel Kant, and um, the beginning of the early Romantics. And in this time, and um, people had only the opportunity to read, to, to get informed about things. And um, he, there was at that time a big, big movement. Um, this is called the, the German classic and the, at all the naturalism and the phenomenological school of, of philosophy. You, you learned about that too, that came afterwards, after, after um, um, Immanuel Kant's uh, scriptures, and they all said that it's um, absolutely undeniable and self-understood that all men have to go to a big mankind union to avoid further dangers and uh, damages. And at these times, from like 77 on to, to 1880, there was never a dispute, never a doubt about these ideas. These doubts came to the idea um, only as early as the First World War came. Um, here, I have to see here is the United States, the German peace movement, Bertha from Suttner. What he, what um, Andreas also forgets is the Hager peace conferences. The, ha the peace conferences of Hague. Um, one moment concerned about building a world state already, including uh, including a police world state and uh, what was it? Yeah. Including police world state and uh, all uh, government and uh, democracy. And this was pushed by um, the U.S. president of that time and the Tsar, the Tsar of uh, Russia. And we would have all these things if not the German emperor would have come and said, oh, now the position of Germany is still too little, too small. We need to become an imperialistic uh, nation and then we can join into the world family. That was only the idea of uh, our Wilhelm II. We would then start a uh, world war first. If he wouldn't have been, we would live in a unified, in a unified mankind since a uh, hundred years because of these guys here that wanted to make this happen. Could you say that one more time? I didn't quite understand. You're saying that uh, it's more or less that the, the, the German emperor alone is is guilty of us not having a. A federal world. You, that is uh, Tsar Nicholas, who was pushing it. Yeah, that that is quite a common thing to know about the German world federalists. I, okay. Yeah, going back. Um, but now let's go here to to the history um, we've seen here. Um, that is here printed for the uh, citizens of the United States that um, at a conference in Brussels, the delegation of the United States Congress suggested the establishment of a world parliament. You see, it was at the initiatives of the United States too, to make that 100 years before. Um, but then war came. There was a conference to build a new League of Nations. Then the new League of Nations was built. Um, Henry Ford in the midst uh, someone of the war, someone said, uh, we wanted to have a world parliament. Um, yes, then it was uh, of the British, the British foreign minister suggested that the establishment of a world parliament might be uh, studied, yeah, you see, 
the other one is established it and now it's only studied. Um, Albert Einstein um, wanted to have it uh, called for young delegates and so on. Um, and now in the newer history it is more interesting because um, now there was um, Professor Richard Falk and others, um, Andrew Strauss, to promote the World Parliament. And they were from outgoing from the Commission of uh, on Global Governance that was installed by the U.S. Uh, government. And uh, they all said we could uh, save a lot of time, a lot of diplomats by having a World Parliament. But at the time, um, the U.S. ain't uh, ain't voting for it um, for for different reasons. Um, Václav Havel called for it, Nelson Mandela called for it, um, the Congress of World Federation of United Nations Association um, called for it, UNPA, Swiss parliamentarians called for it, and then in 2007 the, um, the campaign for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly has been launched and uh, with the financial support of the IPU and, and others. And Andreas Bubel, um, was uh, then elected the boss of it um, because he published the ideas of the composition and how it could be done and had the best strategical paper on it. Um, yes, uh, the most biggest efforts is that the Pan-African Parliament has called for it. Um, the Green World uh, Congress, that is the whole uh, Green Party of the whole world, is calling for it. And then it's got more modest Switzerland, the Latin American Parliament that's not modest is calling for it. And yes, about there is somehow a little bit drawing out. Now the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe is um, also um, calling for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. That is not bad, but that is not already the Parliament, uh, the European Parliament. The European Parliament calls for a debate on the UNPA by now in the year 2017. And uh, the other endorsers here from, from the last years are the Seychelles. Um, the, the European Parliament has endorsed it as uh, the resolution on the UN policy. Yes. Um, how, how significant is that? That seems that seems pretty uh, significant. That is pretty significant um, because it, it means that the European Commission and is bound, and all European uh, financial liquidities might be took into consideration for following up this proposal. Hmm. That is a cl clear due given from the Parliament to its government to make it so, that's resolution of the law. Um, but it's on the EU's UN policy, it's not uh, about Europeans, uh, uh, Europe's uh, poli uh, policy uh, towards the world, it would be something different. It's also not um, sustaining a campaign or somehow funding a campaign. It's also, call it's only calling the um, it's diplomats to um, think about it and to endorse it. And what we would need would be um, big monies for having it TV campaigns, to having it um, adverts in print, press, and and more to put this idea out of the range of being a utopia uh, or a utopia to um, into the range of being a needed governmental action. Many politicians by now might be fearing that international federalism is damaging them in their role. And therefore, um, we, would need, we need more public. It's not the case. Uh, everyone in Europe like, likes this. Um, I had here this survey um, open. We, um, this is also financed by the World Federalist Movement and others. And it clearly shows that here in Argentina, Australia, everywhere the people are in favor, except in Russia, um, of having a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. The Russian president, as far as I know, would, would be um, open to this idea. He was proposing an international currency 
um, as a basket uh, basket currency to stabilize the other world's currencies. And this would go perfectly hand in hand together with another um, democratic UN institution, I'd say. Um, but I don't know his opinion. So here, to come finally somewhere to an end, you have on the UNPA campaigns all the details and all the data about um, the political progress on the diplomatic side. It's a very good in picture. And we have on the World Parliament uh, now.org side uh, the same trial to um, organize the activists and this side would be in the best case than the TV side um, for broadcasting all these cool actions, speeches and films like the one we're doing now permanently on the internet. We've talked about the um, Interparliamentary Union, who they are and uh, where they're from. Also important is the World Federalist Movement. They are holding together um, the ideas and giving support, financial support and, um, and others. Currently, they are um, more into backing the International Court for uh, Justice Court than um, backing the UNPA campaign because the UNPA campaign shall stand on its own. Um, there are ressentiments against the World Federalist Movement also in the Uni United uh, States, as far as I know. So since then, um, it is good for the UNPA campaign to be alone standing. But it's uh, important to know that, of course, the World Federalist Movement is, for us Europeans, still a moral uh, uh, compass to go to and to consult always into uh, all World Federalist affairs. Now, the UNPA campaign has um, built a new array of uh, associations that is called Democracy Without Borders. And this Democracy Without Borders shall be come the rooftop of all the organizations that go for international democracy, as well the activist ones as the diplomatic campaigns. Um, this has been found in one year ago, roundabout. And if you wanted to join, its membership costs 150 euros. It's got a declaration. Um, it is uh, bound to the UNPA campaign. And uh, your membership is more or less also to understand as the financial sustaining of the whole UNPA process. Very important to know, here I see a English link, yeah, there's one, is that there's this book coming, coming up here in 2018, um, A World Parliament, Governance and Democracy in the 21st Century. This is, and I have got uh, it already here in the German version, the first and only book that only is about the World Parliament, it's all history, it's arguments for it, and uh, all the questions about its composition. There has never been before a book only about this question. It's got uh, 450 pages, or so 458 pages, and 453, including uh, the bookmarks. And uh, it also is about um, a, in the chapter, I have to, I just have to look it up, a basic income on the earth level. It is about currencies, it is about the financement of this project. Um, it is about the dangers that lie ahead, um, that are menacing this, this project and also about all the possible arguments against it. It is very, very much a politi uh, politological book because it is um, also treating things like um, conscious. Um, where was the chapter about uh, conscious? Um, the, the integral conscious um, of the world citizen um, that in, in a short terms, the uh, the skepticism itself uh, only made possible the uh, reflection of the human as a political being, and that this reflection 
automatically leads would lead to um, a cosmopolitan uh, conscious. That is the integral um, conscious that was brought from the old uh, Greece people. Um, in uh, psychology, the integral conscious is the moving from the mists, the region of mists and uh, fairy tales to uh, the higher level of critical thinking. And Diogenes of Sinope um, that lived uh, 400 before Christ was that one that uh, marked the world of the cosmopolitan and uh, from that day on more or less that he was teaching that uh, cosmopolitical uh, uh, what, is, what is that thing called school um, no one in Europe or in the rest of the world that uh, thought skeptically ever doubted that that would be the best and that is kind of the self-understatement also of our movement. That it is bound um, to the idea of skepticism itself, to the movement out of the world of uh, gods into the world of uh, ratio. So all these things are to find into that book and it's coming forthcoming in February or March somewhere. Here you got a preliminary contents um, dot PDF. I sent that uh, in, into your chat box. You can find it back. Yes. Um, and here's the chat box. Then I want to to show you two or three other associations also um, to um, that are all around all around these uh, uh, ideas of having a world parliament. I'm going back to the share screen. That's only two, two minutes left, I guess so. Yes, that is for once and very important, um, the World Constitution and Parliament Association. That is a 1950s, 50 roundabout built uh, branch of the World Federalist Movement. And it was the most progressive branch because from the beginning on it went forward to a constitution of earth and they have developed the constitution of earth in a more or less democratic way they tried uh, with the best to have a really transparent democratic process and uh, meetings had they had this and, and they're still meeting and you can see um, this conceptual model of uh, the earth federation um, in um, publications um, what's more, what's also here is it, um, but not with paintings. I got a printed version somewhere with paintings. Is it in reach? No. Um, this is therefore interesting because it is the only um, association that has thought about um, how to have it. Uh, the parliament finally a president, um, a government, a um, superior body that is governing um, the whole earth. And we are hoping as activists, at least those that are progressive, that the deputies to the parliament of the United Nations would adopt those ideas too to um, finally set themselves through with the idea of having it a government, a complete government would fall um, apart into three, the House of Peoples, the House of Nations, and the House of Councillors, where the councillors, what's quite interesting is uh, scientists. The House of Nations would be all the elected diplomats from the governments of the nations, and the House of People by you would be elected from people, um, di probably then direct candidates in the best case. And they are pretty far uh, reaching, um, but in my opinion, it's uh, still missing a third or maybe the half of all the necessary rulings that would have to be, uh, be part of the competences of the world government to um, make it round, to make it without um, oppositioning um, arguments in that. 
this is more or less important uh, to know because some people might think these uh, they are op oppositioning themselves the, the democratic world parliament and this world government thing in the end they have not a lot to do with each other they come out of the same corner and this is more idealistic this uh, world uh, world parliament um, movement um, in, um, in, in comparison to the to the Yunpa campaign movement. The Yunpa campaign is a totally pragmatic and is trying to, to, to campaign and to loudly shout on every marketplace it, it can go. So, um, also interesting is uh, that there are parties like me, I'm a member of that party and the speaker of that party, round about the idea of world federalism. Um, this is here in Germany. Um, we're, we're coming out of the Esperanto movement. Esperanto is very, very important in uh, the world federalism. Um, and in Japan, there is also a party that is uh, concerning only about these uh, questions. That is here, and here's the World Government Institute and the World Party. And uh, it's active, it's got quite a lot of members, it's got uh, uh, around about 200 or 300, might be more. See here alone in Bangladesh how many people, World Party Bangladesh, are active uh, for this World Federalist uh, Party. And the difference between now this uh, Japanese party and, and uh, the, the German one is that the Japanese go more for the constitution of Earth and the Germans um, from the Esperanto movement coming um, would be also satisfied with having step by step the democratic um, parliament first and then others. I personally would have my party rather than being like uh, the Japanese, but that's another thing. Uh, Can keep you explain it would you mind explaining the difference between um, the Japanese model this, of a, a gov government of Earth versus the other model? What is the difference? Uh, that, it's not models. The Japanese are claiming a constitutional Earth by program, and uh, the Germans are trying to have it diplomatic by saying uh, we want to have all efforts into that direction. Oh, okay. If there's a difference at all, um might be you see um so, so the, the difference is that one is uh one is focused on a strategy of how to get there the other one is saying is is more focused on like the yeah, the, the, the one world part the one world party is more making on harmony and we are all together one or thing and all things will come to a good end finally and the world party ja uh, uh, in japan is claiming we need now a world government, a president on earth to radically uh, radically clean up. So the Japanese are much more radical into progressive into these affairs. Um, to, to what extent would, would, would an assembly like this, I'm sorry to inter interrupt you, but um, I just wanted to know if you have uh, thoughts on some of the things that you've mentioned, like universal basic income. Uh, I right. saw at least one of the things you showed, I think it was um, uh, some, some some earlier movement. Uh, I think right after World War II, this movement was very focused on um, abolishing international warfare. Um, so just take those two things, a, a universal basic income available to every single person on the planet, uh, number one, and then uh, abolishing international warfare entirely. How How exactly would a world parliament be capable of doing these two things? Other at all, it would be at this moment in the campaign probably bad to overload the idea with having uh, it utterly and ultimately coming to that success from the moment on we ban to a world parliament will have that uh, basic income or something. Yeah, I guess it'll be like that in the end. But um, if we tell now like this, uh, the Republican Party of the United States would come panic in um, many conservative parties in Britain would become panic and everyone that is a hollow carrot and uh, would be fearing for for its job for its job in the parliament yeah 
I see. Yeah. And uh, that is uh, among the problems we deal with. That is totally practical. Yeah. Um, I, I myself founded here a campaign on Facebook for the uh, International for a Global Social Currency. It's called Campaign for a Global Social Currency. And I'm gathering here all, um, all the people that are interested and that have a say into that. Um, there is here, here's the head of the World Constitution Parliament Association, but also all the, um, Enno, here's the campaigner, Enno Schmidt from Switzerland, and also Daniel Henley is in it, that is the founder of the, of the basic income movement in the Swiss, the president of uh, the Association of World Citizens is in it, and many, many, many others that have to do with it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to have a uh, like must-have proposal uh, to, to, to look at um, in the case that the parliament gathers for the first time. It would be like the fish, uh, chair flyer that uh, lies around the, the, the chairs there when they first, for the first time, sit down in their parliamentarian seat. Mm. That would be my dream for it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it would be wise to, to, to campaign for world federalism with a global social currency because since when it would be given out to all the world at once, and there'd be no uh, ruling, and moreover, no institution to uh, keep these rulings uh, on. There'd be ecological disaster. Everyone would be buying oil, everyone would be buying um, houses, pieces of forests. The animals would be buying out within 10 years. Global uh, climate change would raise, and so on. So therefore, this is a sensitive matter. Um, that not to uh, to drive us into ecological disaster. There have to be um, frame conditions to be met with a global social currency. For example, for me, it would have to be more or less digital that you can stir what to buy and what not to buy, and uh, and so and things like that. Um, I'm pretty sure that my proposal won't be brilliant enough uh, to, 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 to have it made finally um, because the ecological thing is, is absolutely that what, what I'm um, cranking on and craving for. Um, how can you pay out money um, without having the earth destroyed? Yeah, uh, so at, at least that, that much money that really um, gives a Western standard that would be somewhere for Africa between three, uh, 200 and 300 euros. All nations would have to um, offset their current um, uh, measurements for, for salary to an, into a new um, uh, pattern. Uh, that has never been done before and it wouldn't be possible to do for, for all enterprises at once and would pose simply big, big problems. So you're saying it would kind of require uh, like a simultaneous global policy shift around, for example, emissions or... Um, right, exactly so. So if, uh, because one could see that um, of all the money paid out, 20% go into, uh, I, I'd have to count it out in order to make it believable, but it's uh, to estimate between 10 and 30% into fuel only because people want to move to, to visit, uh, Others, as they may might have more time, maybe they'd be traveling also more. Um, and at least um, also the economy um, shows that every increase by 10% of the economy um, results in an increase of 20% or 30% of uh, fuel mm -hmm. consumption. Yeah. And that is, uh, that is a big point. That uh, why in, in, in the best case for me, it would exclude all uh, fossil fuels. And that would need a, uh, a intelligent CASA cas system, machinery, and an intelligent uh, bill, money bill, that you have in, hold in your hands. Well, RFID chipped one um, with identity uh, recognition of what is uh, bought and paid and so on. An intelligent money paper. 
um, that would be my idea, but I, I don't know um, how uh, quick that could be uh, made. Um, so you see, that is in a very, very early stage, and that is exactly also therefore we want or uh, we don't want to to overload um here the the bigger thing that is cooking like i said uh, since 250 years already and uh, we had we should um, eat that goulash then by now and um, before it's completely burnt in and by, by other opinions like you, you for example, made the proper position to make a sortition on the candidates. That is pretty anarchic. And as far as I can see, the United States um, and its uh, new world order, um, new world order uh, ideas are also pretty anarchic. And that is the only that is somehow the only charm that swaps there over because uh, in in concrete and there are no solutions uh, of the from the new world order that uh, Bush senior fledged into the microphones and the younger, uh, younger John Walker Bush, or was it Jeff Walker? No, I don't know. They pre named the younger Bush and then uh, George ran, in, ran into the World Trade Centers. Yeah. Made it therefore somewhat believable for me that uh, there's something behind these ideas. But a real structure? Was not left then uh, for for a while. Yeah, that is the wisdom I came for. The One World Trade Center is at least more ugly, and it whistles. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> what, what what about the uh, what about the question of public opinion? Because that was one thing that really shocked me when I first started looking into this was just how popular this idea is. It uh, in almost every country in the world. Um, I, I looked at public opinion polls. Uh, about the idea of creating a UN parliamentary assembly. Um, <clears throat> and in e every single country, really, except for a few, it was it was way over half of the population uh, supported the idea. And that included, what really surprised me is that it included both the UK and the US, with, which, which both, um, you know, just uh, adopted the Brexit policy and uh, elected Trump. So, so even in these two countries that we would think it would be the least popular, uh, even in those countries, the majority of people who were polled anyway, if, if the polling was accurate, um, support this idea. So I find that really fascinating. And I, I wonder how, 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 if that is really true, how, how that, that uh, basic um, uh, aspect of public opinion uh, already kind of being there for, for this idea, uh, how can that be mobilized in order to um, move forward and trying trying to achieve it? It has been done since uh, we we seen it like, like since seventeen eighty. You can do that by um, philosophical scriptures. You can do that by activism. You can do that by chants. By uh, ch um, you can do that with music. Many many songs have been written about uh, one word things. Um, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is essentially, uh, but this is essentially not sharp enough to um, uh, get it, it a place into the uh, into TV. So, in the end, you need a lot of uh, witty and bright activists that are uh, bringing that uh, into the thoughts with their power of ear shaking, I'd say, and uh, that. That is the thing we are now collecting here <laughs> from World Parliament now and from the UNPA campaign. People that uh, whose minds are sharp enough that know that with their pressure of mind and with their uh, look at the things, um, they can change a lot. And here in Europe, most people fear also at the side that the United States might be going to unite with the Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet Union, Russia and the Chinese to overrule the Europeans by saying, oh, it was the Europeans worse, the whole uh, globalization thing and the whole uh, environmental disaster. So we ran them over and now we're the goods again. So that's the fear here in Europe. Interesting. Well, and, I asked a lot uh, of... Oh, go ahead. And I, I think if that would be happening, 
that be a big man kind of catas uh, catastrophe because uh, people in Europe wouldn't forget any anymore that uh, the United States cheated them by, by killing millions and millions and wasting the lands with the atomic outrage and so on. It, it wouldn't, it yeah. couldn't go good, you see, such an action. Yeah. Couldn't go well, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I've asked a lot of questions, so uh, uh, while we while we still have Fabian, I think where where you are, Fabian, it's quite late, and I, I really appreciate you uh, giving us such a such a thorough presentation. It's really awesome, really uh, fantastic. Yes, I um, just wanted to give you also an outlook on on things to come from France. We um, we had in from France the Monsanto Tribunal um, is they're preparing for ha um, having. Um, what is it? Having a rights attempt um, for the ICC, the International Criminal Court, that is called Nature Rights, that, that thing. And they want to have landscapes, uh, per, uh, personal rights and enterprise rights. And uh, this sounds to many as far-fetched off as the UTP of having a democratic mankind. In the end, it is only one or two sentences in the whole corpus of uh, law texts that changes that situations that then a landscape can have the same rights as an enterprise can have. And uh, the same case is with the United Nations National Assembly that um, the parliaments would need to adopt only two sentences as a resolution that they sustain this and they'd be legally bound to set this idea through. For Europe, the case very important is that the European Parliament has not the right to go over the sovereignty of uh, single nations as long as it's no European Republic yet. And uh, that is where the idea of an international parliament is uh, touching with the European um, Republican idea. Most of the nations currently are more or less in distance with the idea of a European Republic because um, it sounds to them more chaotic and, and more in disorder than a uh, current state would be in comparison. And, and that is ridiculous, of course, because common institutions would bring more order to, uh, to them. And the diversity could be uh, saved too. Uh, but we have the problem that the European authors concerning about the idea of European Republic are calling that the utop utopia. Um, uh, uh, utopia and, and the utopia of the U European Republic is now coming into discussion in the German politics since uh, one week as uh, the Social Democratic Chancellor candidate made this a claim of his party, the second biggest party in Germany. But also Andreas Bubel said its uh, idea about the world parliament would, would be more a uh, utopia that has to be now fulfilled. And uh, them both were not Slavic languages speaking because uh, utopia and Slavic languages might sound like uh, drown someone, utopia or, or bake someone through. In in both regards, the if the word utopia would have some connotations in Russian, in Czech, in, in Polish, or someone, it would be bake or drown, and that's not so good. That's why I don't like this term utopia at all. I, I hope, nonetheless, that it, it can set through on this way. Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Maria wants to kind of uh, start off the questions and facilitate that. Yeah, sure. Actually, we have, we specifically have, oh, we have uh, Jacob who um, had a question earlier that, Jacob? Jacob, do you want to go? Sure. Um, so this, you might have, have touched on it during the talk and I might have missed it. Um, and, and it's somewhat similar to some of Jason's questions. Um, but so I, so I understand the potential for, for a lot of good that could occur from sort of a one, a, a one world government. Um, as you mentioned, things like, um, Policy is about things like sustainability and those sorts of things. The potential from a one world government uh, far out, far surpasses the potential that we currently have in their, with, with the multiplicity of states. 
Um, but I'm, I'm wondering what sort of mechanisms could be put in place to keep this sort of thing from simply scaling up politics as usual. So the fear, of course, is that with one central government, there's the potential of some sort of totalitarianism taking place um, on a much larger scale than on an individual state. Um, but even more than this sort of totalitarian fear is the fear of corporate interests really taking over the entire thing. So currently, um, individual states are able to implement certain regulations on things like environmental protections. Um, and as we see right now, the United States, for instance, is really getting rid of most of those environmental protections uh, in order to appease industry. Um, but this happens in other countries as well. Uh, Canada, uh, Trudeau last year, allowed a number of pipelines that I think he initially said he wasn't going to allow. Um, but, but in any case, I'm wondering if, if there would be mechanisms to stop this sort of corporate spending that, that could influence policy on, on a global scale, because it seems much more dangerous to have a sort of global government taken over by the right wing, which would get rid of any governmental regulation on environmental policy because um, if, it, if it comes on a worldwide scale that's almost even more dangerous than it currently occurs on a country-by-country uh, -country scale. Um, so I'm wondering what sort of mechanisms could be put in place to stop this sort of neoliberal takeover of the, of the one world government and if that's possible at all. The neoliberal attempts are not so much uh, uh, con concerted by by one uh, single force, as far as I can see. We have uh, there are many um, organizations that are um, going into the direction of having it uh, the better solution to be a neoliberal world. Within them um, are mostly the the chefs of the big uh, industrial associations. That is true. Um, but uh, the reason why their ideology is the neoliberalism is probably that they haven't been taught otherwise and haven't been campaigned into another direction. Um, that was the ratio and the good fitting ratio until the 70s of the whole world that uh, more industrialization is uh, making things better for the people. Um, and it was one of the solutions or the cause or the idea of freedom at all for 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 the people here in Europe and also um, the pure um, possibility to economize on your own um, and uh, therefore it's, it's uh, I, I, I wouldn't say uh, that uh, the Classical world federalist, the world citizen here in, in, in Germany, in Europe, is, is so much the leftist activist into that um, ultimately non-neoliberalistic way, um, as uh, as one might think. The um, colleagues here that decide themselves to be only world federalists uh, are often police. They are police cops in uh, in in the north in northern Germany. Many of them, um, then the people that make the Aachen Prize, the people that make the Kant Prize, and the globalization activists themselves haven't found them together here in Europe yet to uh, build a movement for a um, parliamentary association. Um, we so to, to, to come back to, um, to breaking the world power of the corporations. Um, we have to pick out, um, as we're doing for nature rights and anti ecocide, it's another movement I wanted to show you afterwards. Um, we have to pick out the single corporations, the single crime, and uh, sue them in court. There's no other way. And, and it has and that court has to be on the scale of the world because the corporations are on the scale of the world. A US court cannot, cannot really do that. Um, that is 
Well, it could. It could. There's a, it's calling flying courts, uh, the flying court ship, I think, um, the, or the system of flying courts in uh, which you can sue nearly everything on any um, world location as okay. as long as one of the both parties agrees yeah right okay and but but, but so there is an advantage yeah. to it, there is an advantage to it being on a world scale given that <clears throat> given that uh, with say multinational corporations that that don't really answer to any one government per se um, wouldn't you say uh, or not? I, I don't know it. I'm, I'm not completely sure about it. And okay. the more um, I eat the proteins of, of Alex Jones and from Infowars, um, the less I know it. <laughs> so, yeah. I actually, I actually first heard about the idea of world government from um, uh, the John Birch, the John Birch Society, which is like a, a kind of libertarian. Um, uh, American traditionalist group uh, okay. in in Michigan, and um, they had all these conspiracy theories about it, and it was really bizarre. But uh, yeah, there are things going on, and uh, at all all the big industrial corporations can use their influence to um, move big markets, to move their, uh, for example, um, rate of purchase tax, purchase tax uh, uh, up and 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 down or Yes, to, to have um, what's uh, at all super decisive in all um, international trade affairs, that these trade affairs are um, decided with contingents of things. Um, f like 50 b trades for $50 billion between the Euro, uh, Europe and US go for free and everything afterwards is taxed with 10%. That is a typical typical construction and now it's important what's within these 50, 50 billions and what not so uh, you can be sure that therefore the people from BMW BMW are running um, up and down in Europe to uh, be sure that their cars are within the free trade uh, um, agreements and something else would fall out like uh, biological sausages from France you see that is also mm -hmm. into the gaming and uh, um, this is something what uh, what must be changed again by a special uh, NGO that is in that case uh, lobby control and their efforts to throw out lobbyists out of the parliament or at least to make the effects uh, public in count. Yeah. Also, in terms of uh, reigning global capitalism, I think J Jacob brought, a, uh, brought up a really good point um, about uh, how it's very possible that we could end up with uh, corporate lobbyists and sort of uh, politicians being bought, bought off and that kind of thing, uh, very similarly to um, how it, how things tend to function right now in on the nation state level. Um, nevertheless, though, I mean, uh, if if we have a, a kind of global capitalist, you know, border free world for um, for 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 markets, uh, the only way to to rein in um, the power of, of, of global capitalists is global government, I, I think. I, I don't see any other, I don't see how any national government or any... Global, govern, global governance is, with, uh, is given since uh, the early uh, leagues of nations or since um, even earlier back since uh, the 17th uh, century, since the first uh, treaties to the peace between Protestants and Catholics, there is something known like uh, laws of nations. And uh, yeah. it always can be made a treaty um, that is governed by a third party. And um, you can secure these treaties like in private economies with, uh, with funds, or you can leave that aside if you trust uh, enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, last or 100 years or so, all treaties have been made on a non-funded site, and uh, that led to uh, the missing urgency uh, to have them fulfilled. And uh, I'd say uh, for sure we need something more power and more steam to set them through. Um, and to have this we uh, have to uh, be um, more on the law side. And that is why also the law associations in World Federations are so um, overwhelmingly important. I can 
is the international campaign um, against nuclear wars, but the um, people behind it are the lawyers against uh, nuclear wars. Um, also in the development world, the people most trusted uh, in their correspondences are the Médecins Sans Frontières, um, the um, Doctors Without Borders. And th without those super believable uh, um, correspondees, you couldn't go for a law case. That's so simple. And uh, the media are growing together and uh, the internet is bringing all this information um, available and uh, the flying law course makes it possible then to sue a, for example, the new Guinea um, palm oil plantations. You could sue at your local village's court. You could do so. You simply don't know, perhaps. Um, you, you, you'd have to pick it out in some relevance, of course, to the United States, like uh, and to sue a McDonald's or something. But it could uh, bring you a good job. Uh, we have a question from uh, Fujio. Yes. Thank you for uh, for thank you for um, uh, being here with us. Uh, my question would be in terms uh, you had mentioned uh, possibilities or some thoughts around uh, global currency and uh, universal income. Has any thought been given to a a society or world that is not based on a monetary economy? Um, even in Utopia by Thomas Morris, that is a fictive world, the money plays a role. Uh, I wouldn't actually know even a fictive uh, book about a world without having money. The World Par uh, Parliament, Constitution Parliament Association has a time money currency that is about uh, how long you have to work to gain one unit of this currency. It is a currency at all, and um, a world without money would be one where no money would be needed. As an old Trekkie, um, that is the replicator, what's needed then, and uh, what else was needed. A lot of agreements over land, housing, medical services, a lot, and the replication machine. <laughs> yeah, then it, then it could be done. But um, up to up to this point, it would be then certainly total. It would be um, socialism, total socialism, and um, that was the idea behind socialism. That a world without property, a world without money, is uh, there. Everything belongs to everyone, and the money is only the counting unit that um, does order you into your role into socialism. So therefore, um, socialism a long time claimed that they had no money at all. They were driving an economy without money. At least in the beginning, also Stalin was a fan of this, of this theory. Then perhaps it is more or less the, our change in attitude towards, towards money or the, what, how do you, how do you accommodate for uh, greed, which is somewhat of an, seems to be a natural propensity of ours. <sighs> That is uh, probably exactly the railway where it's going. The railway greed is a personal thing, and in all companies I worked yet, and all friends I have in higher positions, they develop greed not as a personal misconduct, but as a necessity of a leading position and a critical, profit-oriented spirit in a in a business. So uh, it's a virtue and uh, for, for the working people by Thomas Piketty. and, and it's, 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 no, it's, it's not a misconduct and uh, that, that lies within the natural um, absurdities uh, or perhaps not absurdities in the, national, in the natural conditions simply of an economizing system. Yes. Uh, I, th I think I heard Matthew Donovan starting to raise a question. 
Yeah, Matthew, um, you started speaking, but then maybe not. Oh, oh I was, yeah. um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's actually uh, an assertion made by Thomas Piketty around um, the relationship between uh, a world government and multinational corporations escaping um, via tax havens and tax evasion. Um, and it is not necessarily a way to curb greed because it's kind of an abstract, that's a kind of abstract con uh, concept. Uh. And but we know that a, a world tax, as proposed by Piketty um, and Capital, would be a practical uh, step towards at least reallocating a lot of these funds to, uh, you know, and that's another uh, assertion for why the world, one world government would could be potential. But even Piketty admits how far off this would be. Does he actually mention world government? Because I always wonder when I hear that that type of thing, a, a global tax on speculation or, or whatever it is. Um, when people say that kind of thing, what entity are they imagining imposing this? It's, it, it seems like it has to be a world government, but I, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have to be. Are you asking if uh, Thomas Piketty is pr proposing this with or without a world government? Was that the question? Oh, um, he actually doesn't um, mention world government, but I think that for it, to act, for it to materialize, there would have to be a world government. Um, yeah. But he says even in the, the you know, divided nation state and the present way things are now that it seems impossible, but he doesn't really know how it could be materialized. But I think everyone here would probably agree that if we could move towards the, the world government, that it would be a potential. Mm -hmm. But right now it has, there's no potential for it. I've got Piketty here and I've read him and Piketty is more making the, um, the ideological point that the um, economical system cannot move outwards of this agreed uh, self-sustaining circles and, and the self-pushing up circles and that it needs to develop more and more greed um, to um, be economizable. I, um, I'm, I'm not, not yet perfectly sure whether it's uh, um, the argument that will be adopted by um, the plurality, plurality of all the people, or the majority, um, and I'm still, yes, and my main concern is what will be the argument that most of the people will swallow the first and like to, like to uh, uh, repeat. And I think such an argument is more basic income, the carrots given, uh, than the complexities of all economized uh, products on Earth. And... Uh, Yes, that is why I, I don't like Piketty um, that that much. He has made um, the point, um, and it, it's absolutely agreed among all philosophers and politologists here also in Europe, that um, the um, economy is driven by profit, a, a non-stoppable uh, human-eating um, empire that will be destroying nature. And that is since Piketty, no doubt anymore. And also among more or less the conservative people. That is what European uh, philosophy schools could, could do with it. But we still need the um, yeah, beat to death argument for our cause. And I guess this will be something like um, universal basic income. Um, and this something is not universal, uh, universal basic income by itself, but uh, universal um, general health care and uh, existential basic needs coverage, like a social system and the health care. And that, these could be the first steps to um, a working international basic income or better international social system than could.
and the universal international healthcare is uh, I heard hardly and seldomly about it. Uh, I haven't uh, read any publication about it yet to give that such a kind of thing away for free. Maybe it's you always funny. It's always funny when the word universal comes up and then it becomes obvious that what people mean by universal is actually national. <laughs> you know. Um, um, yes, uh, there would be no um, contradiction into having you um, big uh, radiation investigations on your bodies like MRT, computer resonance tomography, while while Africans would, would only get uh, two or three pills of antibiotics a, a month, but someone that ha would have to go to, to the same levels. And uh, most medical uh, systems on earth are pretty much so socialistic. Uh, the state pays in and, and pays over it. Um, and there's no way out, more or less. And, and that is something. And then when you'd say um, now the United States wouldn't have to pay um, for social health care for the people anymore, but still they would get treatments worth 500,000 uh, euros or something even the least hobo, they probably buy it into that carrots. Well, like, uh, 25% of them elect donkeys and the other ones are also big mammals. Why not? And uh, you would have to bring that together with uh, the proposals of uh, the healthcare to, to the other states that don't have yet such a big system. Because it would be looking awry if in the United States 80 billions would be paid out or even more, probably five, 300 to 500 billions could be paid out into that thing. Um, while at the same time in Rwanda or in South Africa only 500 millions could be paid out at all because there are no doctors. That would be looking awry, but um, one has to swallow that toad and uh, afterwards good. And I, in, into one have to, to, to think into that direction. So what is the, the um, best, uh, yeah, the hottest dog, the hottest hot dog in New York? Like, yeah, what is the thing that everyone wants to eat? We international community and uh, yeah, also the guts for wokes and um, culture is so totally different. Um, that one have to think only in the thing like positive, negative. Uh, positive is something to enchant for, to um, to vibe with. Negative is something to beat, to fight against. But uh, fighting is uncultural, it's forbidden by police. So you have to stick with a positive thing to keep up the global conscious in anyhow. That's my wisdom after like 15 years into, into that these affairs. Or what would you say? Would would you uh, like serve a, as Americans Piketty and then uh, strike the social uh, socialist movement of the United States, make it the Council Republic of uh, Portland or Seattle? <laughs> I, I'd like to. I'd like to see that. Would be. Well, Seattle is one of the only cities in the U.S. that has a that actually has a socialist uh, on the city council. Um, oh, okay. The only one socialist one so. on the city council, yeah. One socialist. Yeah. We have uh, in, in Portugal alone, the communists are beating themselves with the with the socialists uh, for the majority. Wow! And that they are running the nation. Communists and socialists, and in Greece too, they they have influence and importance. Iceland also tra uh, traditionally, yeah. Yes, uh, like uh, you, you, you know that our leading personnel from uh, here in Europe comes mostly from Portugal, and uh, they are currently ruled by by a coalition of socialists and communists. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, are there other people, Maria, who wanted to ask questions? Yeah, are there? Um, I have I have a very kind of basic question. I'm still kind of new to this, um, but I find it intriguing. I have a question um, about, well, first of all, are these models all meant to um, like replace the power of nation states completely? Like to what degree? I know they're, they're, they're different and they kind of don't overlap, but um, if, if, if they are like meant to seek to transform um, governance and power on such like a totalizing large scale 
um, why, what is, is all hope lost in like reforming nation states or um, in like, our nation, like what, what, is, what is the idea? Um, I'm just trying to understand the final vision or what, like on a local scale, what it would look like um, if there was like this world parliament or um, a globe, like a global planetary governance. So the vision is well existing, um, but um, the point uh, is that it is not overdrawn. Um, it be a counseling institution to the United Nations and to the nations, and its uh, influence would raise by its charms, so to say, with its attention in the public. Um, the original responsibilities of the Parliamentarian Assembly to the United Nations would be the seas, the space, and all the um, issues that are uncleared currently now by international law. That's and that is not a lot. You, you could say that environmental pollution is among those that uh, things that know no borders and that need to have a common decision by an international parliament. Um, but then still the nations wouldn't be bound to hear to that international parliament. Wisdom goes uh, into that situation that very probably the parliamentarian deputies would conspire together to find actions to make themselves heard with initiatives um, that are inspiring or that are um, testing people's minds uh, in a way that they come into discussion. And these are the hopes that then by these actions and going over the understatement that the environmental pollution is a international affair space pollution, that the economical situation is an international affair, and so on, they uh, could put forth institutions to then found, for example, a financial ministry, a social ministry, a environmental ministry. And one does not know after how many ministries there be uh, a a uh, council of, uh, of, of, of governors necessary for it. So um, a president, finally, see, to, to, have a, to have it a real republic or, or something like it. Here, here in Europe, we have uh, like about 40 institutions that um, have uh, rights like ministries. They shortened it together to like 18. And we have a president and so on. But uh, in the end, the nations have, by law, the, uh, the right to say no to these obligations of, of, of the European Union. Uh, they have to agree to these uh, resolutions. And we can perfectly live with that situation, and it probably would be going on even in a, a European Republic that uh, way. Shrink together, but still, um, uh, national parliaments could complain, and after this complaint, would be very much in question uh, whether the idea be put into action or not. What do you think about this idea of a <clears throat> United States of Europe that uh, was recently um, pushed by uh, the kind of opposition to Merkel? I can't remember the name of the, the party. But uh, they Martin Schulz, yes. Um, yeah. Very much. Um, the European Republic would be um, more a, a economical union of weaker partners and stronger partners, and uh, we would be throwing our budgets together. Um, that would be the main effect of it. So uh, the households of France, Spain, Italy, Germany would be thrown together for the cause that in Italy or France, if the socialists came force and be making a free beer bill, we could drown ourselves into beer forever. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, exactly. Uh, some people like it, some not. And, <laughs> Yep. Would, would, would it effectively, because I'm, what I'm wondering is comparing it to like a parliament, would it effectively, because I mean, there's only a couple really powerful 
in Europe, right? Um, and, and the other nation states are significantly less powerful than, than those nation states. And I'm thinking France and Germany. Right. So th that being the case, sure how the population adds up, but similarly to a world parliament, um, wouldn't, wouldn't that probably mean that it would, it would uh, greatly empower uh, currently less powerful nation states in the realm of economic policy? Probably or, or very much so, um, because um, th that's, that's very interesting that in every big uh, union of uh, bigger and smaller partners, the smaller ones turn out to be the more agile ones and the more active ones, because the bigger ones have, have problems to find uh, decisions, they are slower, and uh, the smaller ones are more agile and so forth more progressive. They, um, yeah, they have more uh, anonymous, uh, animosity to uh, analyze. And that's, uh, here in Europe you see it automatically that's agreed in opinion everywhere and leads to that Portuguese diplomats uh, are the leading diplomats in, in the whole union. Hmm. Do you think that that would be the case with a world parliament as well? Do you think that a world yes, parliament... Yes, there, there is, especially the, the Indian tribes uh, would be for environmental pollution and the whole environmental uh, question, our leading diplomats uh, towards, towards the world. So very probably that be an Indian tribe head um, Matai uh, becoming known for um, the mankind's voice of uh, environment against environmental pollution, something like that. Could be a person that will be driven over the foot by by a caterpillar or something like. Exactly, and that would be making much more impression than here our, our, our sneaker wearing uh, green yuppies from Germany. Interesting. So therefore, it would be an advantage. Um, Meredith, do do you want to speak? So um, circles was something that was floated a few years ago. Um, it's the idea that everyone has their own personal cryptocurrency or currency and that you transact with one another forming these sort of circles and no one really spoke about it i mean i think i, I thought it was an interesting idea but no one really spoke about it um and then all of a sudden recently probably because of the um crazy uh price in in, in bitcoin and in, in ether and litecoin this is this has become i'm, I'm seeing this being spoken about again in sort of tech circles, and in, if you look at their GitHub repository, people are people are starting to basically contribute to the code base again. Um, but uh, it's one way where you can sort of like talk about having a global economy, a global currency, but yet a personalized currency. Um, I think there was this. I guess this was in response to the conversation that started at I guess nine. 40 posted that um but you know but 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 i get um, i don't know I, I i you know i am interested in these in these sort of technological solutions to to um issues that would previously have to be legislated so that's they why. would have previously have to be legislated because bitcoins and all cryptocurrencies are against the laws of currency. Um, every nation has currency laws, and they say that the uh, currency can only be made by the state or on the state's behalf by a issued bank. Um, and uh, cryptocurrency are completely um, going over that border. And at any time, they might be seized by the government without compensation, and the profit of it be going to 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 the jurisdiction or to the government itself. Um, but oh, the, in the case of Bitcoin, where it got now three hundred billion, so someone uh, inlay some. 
I would doubt that the United States government would all such a step. Um, and also what's, uh, what's more or less behind it and on what I'm so frustrated about it is that uh, the software is so bad that it's behind it. This, the BitCore, I loaded it myself, like tried it for now four days. And it would encode all and up to the blockchain blocks now. 28 days or 29 days, it tells me. Um, and that here is a Mac uh, dual core uh, you're on. And it, it, it means that the whole cryptification to get the last crypto key takes me 29 days to then be um, um, able to make trades on, on, on the base of the newest uh, crypto, uh, newest crypto sign. The software is rock old. The software is, I, I think I know it from the year 2005, although it's uh, not official, and has never been, um, never been modified. And that is what I wonder about Bitcoin. Every every other cryptocurrency is built on that Bitcore in the end. And this Bitcore is made for maximum 10,000 people that would share currency with each other. So now every new cryptocurrency has the necessity to go on the local sphere to uh, if, if it uses the um, blockchain um, in, in the classical way, because the blockchain can only bear a limited number of people, otherwise its complexity explodes and leads to energy consumption and, and, and uh, counting times that are not affordable. Yeah, uh, and so I, 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 the, the technique is too bad. It was inspiring. The, the big thing about cryptocurrencies, it, it was inspiring us to these big, big new ideas about money, that it could look every kind of way and so. Um, but it would be needed to be a complete new software, not not the old one. So the software is bad behind it. I mean, one of the things that, I, that interests me the most about this, and this could be sort of techno utopian, is that you no longer. I mean, <clears throat> you can. So, for example, like energy consumption, you can sort of automatically allocate resources in the form of a cryptocurrency depending on certain rules to certain areas so you know if you know if they're and i don't know how you would encode this in your algorithm in one's algorithm but you know rather than having rather than legislating it i mean you could basically have legislators create the algorithm for distributing money essentially rather than legislating laws i, I, I like the idea of something that's automatically implemented not needing an executive branch a government. So, what was the question? Missed like, the question. What, how, how are you going to execute the laws of the global of the global government? The UN resolutions um, are now executed by uh, yeah dismissing uh, one nation to the other uh, each other um, as as being somehow yes. So they, they're coming up with forced terms and um, violations of diplomacy and uh, that is the strafing that is maximum in, in, in maximum going on. But will there be like a global police force? I mean, how is it going to be implemented? There is, know, a, I mean, there is an international yeah. court already. There's an international court for economic uh, things uh, too. That is placed in 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 Europe. Um, currently, it is like that. Um, as soon as it goes over the sum of some billions, um, each court system uh, tries to tries to uh, treat the old nation better than the other, and that is among the problems. And um, to gain their objectivity, we would have to need a big international court systems with layings into each nations that then would be probably costing uh, five to ten billion euros or, or even more. We would have to build more court buildings worldwide to each nation, two or three, to be 600 court buildings, uh, employees and so on. It would rather go over 50 to 100 billion um, dollars to just finance, uh, finance that. So that hangs together. And we need to have the agreement that we have uh, a UN resolution law system that is law, 
put uh, put into force by uh, law and can be sued theoretically by the um, International Chamber of Commerce, the, the court there. Yes, and the, so there was another, the Sea Court, the International um, Court for Transportation and Products. It's another one. Thank you. Uh that's uh it's it was just unclear to me if it was the like local if you would have i mean if you're getting rid of nations like are, are we going to get rid of nation states yes very probably so in the end um but only um through exchanges and uh, through uh, the world city, uh, citizen history itself um the internet and media has brought us into the situation that now languages are freezing into the current situation and the cultural pot can grow into a stable and calm environment bigger theoretically than ever before the exchange the cultural exchange has become bigger but that is restrained to the nation you live in and uh, uh, we uh, only the internet communication as we do it now to speak also in foreign languages will enable you to uh, to uh, really become a believable world citizen that is not thinking about the um, advantages of his own nation first. If I, I, for example, speak pretty, pretty well Chinese, I can speak Czech, could make this conversation also in French. French. And uh, that makes you then um, halfway a person that is believable for not only taking uh, advantages to your own nation. That is what's needed, also. So then, wouldn't that bring in the the idea of, of universal education as well? Uh, yes, that comes with it. Uh, Pupils exchanges, language exchanges, longer time, um, longer time in school, in universities, would be absolutely in the sense of the world parliament and the coming up government or ecological government of Earth. 100%. Because and the so nervous system works like that everything you know, you'd, uh, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't eat, and everything you know, uh, would uh, probably fall among those potential victims to be eaten. Uh, intellectually, at least. <laughs> and wouldn't that include, well, wouldn't the thought of a global, global education also provide room for transdisciplinarism? Which disciplines would be the question? I, me, me personally, I had my enlightenments with simply learning languages. If you, if you speak quite well Chinese, if you, French, or another language, I'd say apart from like if you speak five languages fluently, you you come into a set of mind where it doesn't matter anymore which which language you speak. And and that is something that. Um, that really puts you then among the artists of speaking. And all human development should be orientated alongside of arts, and uh, that is literature, speaking, um, music, dancing, um, the control of your own body, sports, um, and only those things can give you a direct traction of who another person is, what he's striving for, and, yes, and, and what he would be doing in the end if you elected him. So that, yeah, we need a lot of uh, exchanges. I'd, I'd be exchanging with Tonga in Samoa for years, I can tell you. Yep. Was that joke too much? Nobody answering? <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, what I meant by transdisciplinarism was this notion that, uh, that as we have an educational system built around this globalization, that we're able to then reach across to different departments, to different 
different uh, educational systems or different ways of seeing seeing the world, so that uh, we're able to then um, not be siloed in our thinking. Um, Earth, Earth is really a magical place to to the people who've been around and. Um, <laughs> You should have been traveled to all the continents before um, making your your judgment of of what is even in your own head or in the head of the others. It's all so well connected, um, the minds of the people um, that one is wondering. And uh, the most awkward thing, the biggest awe you can, you can find is if you can see and feel this connection, but the actors other connections wouldn't be aware of and instead be falling into war against each other, rotting them out, extincting them completely, destroying the soil, the earth. That is the thing that shall not happen. That uh, over the overwhelming strong connection and the unconscious about it, we'd be extincting ourselves because we'd be saying um, the other one is copying me, the other one is, uh, is, is telling me silly or something, um, by simply not knowing that, for example, uh, there is a city like in Western Australia, like Carl Gurley, that is a thousand kilometers away from another place that's called Perth, Perth, the Australians then say Perth, Perth, yeah, and Perth and Carl Gurley belong together to Western Australia. And every Western Australian would say so. You have to be, you have to be been there that this is an existential, existential issue uh, for for the culture, for the people there. My, it's it's alike. It's uh, it's magic. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know whether you, you can deal with that with that one, but um, also to the Thailand Bangkok is um, the word Bangkok comes originally also from the word Bang for marijuana, and Bangkok means the help or, or, or the grass. And uh, that is only um, to understand in that uh, wittiness of being between China and India. And on all the Thai Thailand people um, define themselves as the middle people between India and, and, and the Chinese people. And if you haven't been there, you wouldn't understand that because you wouldn't have the experience to have met 50 or 100 people who were exactly all the same on that topic and issue. You have to get the experience to meet the people. And that is why we need exchanges. How to go there by electric railway, not by plane, and so that all would have to be solved also. Well, then by, by solar ships. These are all good questions. Maybe we could try to get some people who haven't <clears throat> spoken yet, like uh, like maybe Artem or uh, Eduardo, uh, or Miss Al or, or uh, Jacob. So because, let make another point, because we're talking so much about ecology, the most word federalists and also the left uh, oh. side of the movement, the socialists are going um, people before environment. So we introduce all these possibilities to make exchanges and so. And then on the second hand, we have a look on uh, on the environment for the only reason that the potential negative effects of not networking um, and not knowing the world might be worse than destroying the earth by, um, by traveling it. Um, these questions, uh, finally, uh, I, w I wouldn't know whether they'd pop up at all or not in, 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 in this world, but I guess probably not. Um, yes, that's, uh, yeah, they, they, they would, but uh, I don't know in, in, in how many constraints and when this would be. Um, we had had the possibility we would have had the possibility to uh, to have a common um, currency since the year 2012, proposed by Vladimir Putin. And on that base, we could have had a common um, 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 economical system to plan these kinds of things. And we could still be in that world within five to 10 years. 
But unfortunately, it seems to me that most of the actors have so much fear from the open questions that we wouldn't come to the simple choose that we only need to agree that we want to have the problem solved uh, solved um, and not how it has to be done that is all what federalists do that they gather around and say now let's do it together and solve it the, the way and the how of the solution is, is, is secondary and uh, You've seen it also on the history uh, short before uh, to, to the United Nations uh, Parliamentary Assembly proposal that the doubts are taken gain. My personal theory about that is that these, this is raising with the standard of education. The more the, that people have a universitarian education, the more they have the tendency to doubt. And the more they have the tendency to doubt, the more... Um, Federalist actions or new actions at all wouldn't uh, prevail, wouldn't set themselves through. <clears throat> um, so I want to bring up um, just a, the fact that we have about uh, 15 minutes left, uh, 10 to 15 minutes left. Um, about, about 10 minutes, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, we started slightly oh, late, right. but. Um, Wondering just just to actually Jacob brought it up um, about the idea of sortition that you spoke about earlier, and I was just wondering, like I guess Jason or Fabian, are there like because there, there seem to be many. You said they're not competing models of these like um, global initiatives, um, but are there like radical like are there are there, like, are there like certitian based or radically different models for kind of handling um, or, or like initiatives? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, Podemos, uh, or sorry, um, is that is that what it's called? The the, the one in uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Portugal. Is that it's Podemos? Yes. They, 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 now they call themselves DM, a Democracy in Europe Movimento. Yeah. Yeah, they're using sortition, and the, the main way that sortition is functioning right now, uh, in practically speaking, is in an, uh, in an advisory capacity. Um, true sortition means the randomization of selection and the abolition of elections. Um, but 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 there's kind of a modified version of it that's happening to create basically uh, advisory panels to um, to formulate policy, whether it's economic policy. Policies. So Podemos is kind of like the version of Occupy. Uh, they were part of the the Squares movement. So that's that's one. Another one is the uh, the Royal something uh, uh, of Art. I can't remember what it's called in the UK. Um, they have recently advocated for that uh, for economic policy in the UK. It would require uh, economic um, uh, bureaucrats and politicians to be advised by uh, a randomly se selected jury of, uh, you know, average citizens um, so that they could testify as to what the actual effects have been so far of uh, policies that have existed and also testify what they would actually like to see um, so that so that uh, kind of politicians and technocrats are not uh, simply um, just going off of their own whims, but are but are actually being uh, advised by um, other entities. So that's the main reason that that's the main way that it's happening right now. Um, but uh, but there are there's a Facebook page about sortition that has uh, there's somebody who runs that and they 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 post every example they can find uh, in the news. Uh, there's been some recent ones. I can't remember what the most recent was one was that I saw. Uh, but typically, it's usually sortition is uh, the main innovation is that it's been used as uh, kind of advisory panel, um, but what I would like to see is is like like actual sortition, you know, meaning the abolition of elections. Um, and I think that that, but you know, this uh, I guess we'll start the actual readings next time, and we can get into sortition um, itself, uh, and then we can talk about isonomia, 
uh, and diagonality in the, in the final session, because we'll have three more sessions after this. So this was a really, really great um, introduction to the class, in my opinion, because we started with this really kind of practical material example uh, of the UNPA and World Parliament now. Uh, and you know we've really kind of wrapped our heads around uh, what the what the major proposals are that are out there. And uh, hopefully in the week <clears throat> between now and when, when we meet next, uh, everybody can go and kind of read some of those uh, uh, websites and and texts that are that are posted there. Uh, and keep that in mind when we're reading, you know, like Jacques Rancière, when we're reading um, Kojin Karatani, when we're reading CLR James, uh, and try to think about um, what can we what can we take from what we learned today about this this very uh, palpable uh, actual movement that has a lot of worldwide support uh, from even from actual sitting uh, government representatives. Um, how can we kind of bring the practical and the theoretical together and try to uh, and try to think about um, how something like sortition could be used to um, uh, could be used in relation to this? It could work against the flood of academics that are bringing the doubt into politics and <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> yeah, that was the idea. It's it's interesting. I, I, ha I haven't heard it before. Yeah. Very good, so then. Yeah. It, it, it hit it my last thought exactly on the head of the nail. Great. Yeah, well, th thank you so much, Fabian, for coming. And uh, it's been really great. And this, this really did um, provide a great introduction to the class, in my opinion. Uh, and so next week, we'll start, the, we'll start working on the, the, the readings themselves. Great. Um, so, is it would be the same readings that were assigned for today? Yeah, Great. yeah. And the other reason for that too uh, is that you know the syllabus isn't entirely finished. So, okay. Uh, but the two readings for next week are uh, Jacques Rancière's "Hatred of Democracy" mm -hmm. and uh, C.L.R. James' "Every Cook Can Govern." So, uh, Jacob has already prepared uh, for "Hatred of Democracy," which is great, um, and. Uh, uh, we need somebody to present on CLR James, Every Cook Can Govern. Who would like to do that? It's a, it's a fairly short text. It's, it's, you could probably read the whole thing in 25 minutes. Anyone want to do that? Meredith. Meredith? Great. I'll do it. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Um, and also, by the way, CLR James, uh, I don't know if you know his work, but he, he has a lot of other um, really great theoretical texts and people in his kind of orbit uh, were some of the earliest people to advocate universal basic income from a, from a Marxist perspective. Um, so you might want to look at that too. But yeah, wow. espe especially every endeavor is the one. Yeah, the black Jacobins. Yep. Okay. Um, any final thoughts? Any last words? Mm, I can. I can end the broadcast now. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right.